Hey everyone, this is Roman Prokopchuk and this is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast. Today I have with me Adam Lundquist. Adam is a Harvard educated agency owner and former radio shock jock from Santa Barbara Radio. His company, Nerds Do It Better, consistently delivers paid search campaigns utilizing advanced statistical analysis developed at Harvard. With this method, Adam and his team are able to remove inefficiencies in marketing and generate more customers on a consistent basement basis in a cost-effective way. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your journey. How did you get to where you are today? Sure, so I grew up in um, Boston in uh, Massachusetts. And in Boston, uh, people really look up to kind of sports stars and radio people. We didn't have a whole lot of movie stars, uh, unlike out here in Santa Barbara. So I knew I wanted to be a radio person. I, um, let's see, out of high school, I joined the army and did a couple of years there. And then I ended up moving to Santa Barbara, California. And I knew I wanted to do radio stuff. So I was an intern in radio. Um, and then I became a full-time morning show host, like it said there. Um, and this was around 2006-ish. So the internet was just kind of, it was there, but YouTube was just kind of coming up. And, uh, I filmed an interview with this guy, Sam Cassell, who's a, uh, a basketball player. Yep. And my kind of interviews were where I would always kind of throw them. So it'd be like, a, almost like Ali G back in the day. I don't know if you remember him, mm -hmm. but they'd always be very bad interviews, but bad on purpose. And uh, so I put it on YouTube because I wanted to see what would happen and nothing happened. Like kind of what you would, what you would expect, but not what you hear. So I decided that I wanted to try and make it go viral and just see what that would take. So I started doing things like uh, emailing different blogs and it, this was very early on. So I had like a spreadsheet at this point, but I'd split test headlines to do things like that. And the interview itself kind of blew up. It got a, uh, it's number seven on sports Illustrated's viral videos of all time. It got me on the best damn sports show. It got me all over the place. And that kind of got me uh, interested in, um, in the internet really. So when I uh, got fired from my radio job, which was actually on Friday the 13th, ironically, I got picked up to um, to run the radio stations, the competitors radio stations, um, internet presence. So I ran six of those and then um, I got hired at a startup out of San Diego and we became the uh, second fastest growing privately held company in San Diego, um, which was a, an internet company as well. And then, um, I don't know, I decided I just want to work for myself really. <laughs> and so I, I did. Nice. Where was that kind of point where you uh, made that jump? Uh, were you like ready in terms of skill set and your network or you just, you know, made that leap and ran with it? Oh, when I wanted to work for myself? Yep. Uh, kind of a little bit of both. So my wife works for a big uh, pharmaceutical company. So we were going to have to move once a year anyway. And um, they, the company that was flexible in San Diego, they were basically, they were all right with it. But I just felt like I don't know. You know how you like, you always probably feel like you can do it better than anyone or I always feel like that. Um, and they, they were, they were great and they still are great people, but I don't know. Like we, when we were there, I was working like a million hours a week. Like I was, I was basically sleeping there. Um, at one point I think my boss had like a panic attack from uh, trying to keep up with my hours. And I just thought if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it for myself. And they were also much broader. So they do all the digital marketing. So whether it's emails, SEO, building out these really complex e-com um, on Magento, that kind of thing. Whereas I just wanted to do paid search. Like that's what I'm the best at and that's why, like that's what I like to do. Um, and that's really like where I made my money in their company for them. We took um, a cell phone case company, took them from around 20,000 in revenue a month to over a million in revenue a month. So once those stats were there, um, you know, I had my first client pretty much the week I started the company. Nice. Yeah. And I think it's important to focus what you're good at. I think a lot of agencies try to do everything under the sun and not, you know, be known for that specific thing that, you know, may, they make the needle move for a potential client. Yeah. I mean, that's it. So like there are people who are a lot better at a lot of things than me, but probably not paid search. So when people come to me and they want SEO or something, you know, I, I don't do anything with SEO to tell you the truth. I'm not even sure if my page ranks for anything. But, uh, you know, I, I'll send them to other friends who are agency owners or something. But for my money, direct response, paid search marketing, I mean, it pays the bills over and over. Like, and it's not just like, uh, you know, I say, hey, you guys should try it and I'm not going to try it. I do it for my company as well. And it works really, really well. 
Yeah, I think that's a, that's a big selling point. I, I like to use the example if like a financial advisor or planner tries to sell you an investment and they come to you and, and try to give you something and you ask them, are you invested or do this as well? And they say no, then you know how valid is that? But obviously if you're attaining the same results for yourself and demonstrating it time and time again, you know that, that proof is in the pudding. Yeah. And I think that it's unfair to do it. Otherwise, you know, it's like a, I don't know, like a dentist with bad teeth or something. You're like, listen, I'm sure you may have the knowledge, but if, you know, if you're going to look like that, like you gotta, you gotta, you gotta really do it. There's so much theory out there. Um, and if you don't get your feet on the ground and really see, all right, what does and doesn't matter, you know, like you'll read these, or I would always read these case studies about Amazon that were like, uh, they changed the font of a button and they made a million dollars. Realistically, unless you have a bazillion page views a day, changing the font of a button, unless it's like really hard to read, isn't going to make any difference at all. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's one of those things, I think also when you're uh, in the trenches versus a generalist, like you said, some of those articles, um, when you're actually uh, running things and jumping in and rolling up your sleeve versus just, you know, talking, you know, on a stage or writing a blog post with a few uh, regurgitated uh, talking points. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and I write a lot, but they always fact check it, which I really appreciate. Um, you know, yeah, I wouldn't write a blog if it wasn't actionable and also something I've done. Like, I mean, there's, of course, blogs are like, in the future, this may happen, but those aren't the blogs that I write. That's not, uh, that's not me helping anyone for sure. Yeah, I agree. So uh, what motivates you to succeed? Mm, I think... A lot of this comes from the work ethic of my parents and grandparents. My grandparents were uh, immigrants from Sweden and um, they were just hard workers. Like they were just the hardest workers I could even imagine. And it wasn't like they had a fun job. They worked at, um, I think it was the Norton Bomb Factory out of Worcester or something like that. And uh, they really just instilled like the, I guess the immigrant work ethic. And my, my mom's side like escaped some sort of like pogrom or something in Russia. Like it was just... They both got, they both got out of Dodge. And then um, I like it. Like I like work for me. It's always been something I like, like, and I've had, I've had some pretty not awesome jobs. I had the job where you, uh, you drive the cart, you know, on the golf range and people try and hit you. Oh, you get the like, balls. Yeah. yeah. Like that was one of my first jobs, but I liked it. Like, I think I, I really like work and I don't, um, I don't, I don't know for me, like living the best life I can live involves work and um i'm married like i want to provide for my wife but it's not like like i said she she does very well on her own anyway so it's not even like she needs me to do that but you know at some point i want to you know help the family you know with whatever they need like it was cool we got to put my brother's kids in a nursery school and that i don't have any kids but that's really expensive like i didn't know that yeah no i'm a, I'm a foster parent and some people have to stay at home just to uh take care of the kids because it's so much. It's like another kind of a, a rent or a mortgage, just putting the kids into a preschool or nursery school. Yeah. It's mind blowing. And it's not like something you can say you're not going to do. Cause you can't like, you know, take a kid to work really, or if you can, it's a pretty cool office, but yeah, I've, I, <laughs> I am seeing rapidly that kids are pretty expensive and that's awesome that you're a foster parent. That's a really cool thing to do. Yeah. And then going back to your, uh, the, the immigrant side of your, uh, you know, your parents and grandparents, I'm a first generation immigrant from Ukraine. So I, I've seen, I came here in 1990. So Ukraine was still under the Soviet Union. So coming from a situation where it's more oppressive, it really uh, makes you appreciate kind of their free economy and technically, you know, striving and making great connections and having the knowledge base, you can really do anything. And like you said, you can also learn from Every job you have, regardless if you think it's a crappy job or the best job, you can still have a takeaway and it can leave an imprint on, you know, your professional work and kind of your, your work ethic and outli uh, outlook on life itself. Yeah, I mean, and basically any job is essentially the same. You show up early and have a good attitude and just be the most productive you can be. Like whether I was at the golf course, I mean, that started really early. That was like five in the morning or like I said, I did the army, I done radio, like it's all it's all essentially the same. You just learn as much as you humanly can from the best people. I mean, not so much on the driving range, but like, you know, when I did radio, I really, really studied it and I went to the conferences and um, I mean, it's how I learned to do that. And then with internet marketing, uh, I learn every day. I mean, I read and read and read and read. And so much of it is, um, so much of it is human psychology, which I think is so interesting. 
Yeah, I agree. I think that personal element or that emotional touch point because with anything in marketing, if you leave a, or evoke an emotional response, obviously that's positive. You get to be top of mind over your competitor every day. Yeah. And really like a lot of it is like proving you're not a scumbag, I guess I would say, because internet marketing is such a bad rap I and mean, rightly so. But like, um, <clears throat> you know, if someone needs your service and you can provide it, really you just have to overcome the barrier of like, do they believe you can really provide it? And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people who say they can, but don't have the track record. And, um, you know, that's not really helping anyone in the internet marketing space. But yeah, like I, I think that um, it's, it's a good thing to do and it helps, you know, it helps local businesses, it helps national businesses. It's hard to get new clients. Like if you don't know how to do it, but people think they magically appear and they don't. No, no, it's, it's one of the hardest things. So what's one thing that you may have had and you saw a weakness in yourself in the past that you've turned around and utilized as a strength today? Hmm. I would definitely say uh, that I was not very good at um, writing, actually. So for the longest, I kind of thought I was because I worked for a newspaper, but I was not. But then I learned how to write, and that's one of my biggest strengths today. Um, like I said, I do paid search, but a lot of the a lot of leads come in through um, through our guest blogs, I guess I would say. And you can also end up using them in the sales process, where you know you say, "Hey, before we have this call, you know, why don't you check out this article and see if it resonates?" Because at that point, it's someone vouching for you. It's kind of like um, like I'm just gonna throw out one, like I don't get paid by them or anything, but like Search Engine Journal has wrote one for. So when people say that Search Engine Journal. Uh, allows you to guest post, you know, it kind of shows that you know what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I was a pretty crappy writer for a long time. And I guess um, I was also, and this is a more of a technical skill, but I was terrible at Google Sheets forever. I took a couple courses and I mean, I'll tell you, I'm, like I said, any of this stuff I'm telling you, it's not like I get paid by them. I think Coding is for Losers has a great course. I think Ben Collins has a great course in Sheets. And now it's one of my biggest strengths. Uh, but forever, I was horrible at it. Yeah, I think writing, people think like, oh, yeah, the person's a writer and all they do is sit there and write. How hard can it be? But when you really need to sit down and write like a landing page or some ad copy and, and have it really evoke some kind of emotional trigger or connect with the uh, prospective audience, it's not as easy as you uh, think. I think most things are like that. People are like, hey, we're just going to put something and it's going to go viral online. Not, not likely, <laughs> probably not going to happen. Uh, you know, same as it was with radio. People would come and they'd say, hey, can you put me on the show? And I'd be like, sure, what do you want to talk about? They're like, just going to talk. Well, probably not going to be a very interesting show then. Uh, but yeah, and it's the same actually with, with uh, advertising. Like, uh, we're just going to bid on a couple keywords. Okay, well, like, what's your strategy beyond that? You know, you got you to move people through a sales cycle. And that's something I think people miss a lot is like, uh, so most of, my, most of what I do is lead generation rather than uh, straight e-commerce just ends up being better on the back end for both me and the clients. Like I have a lot of uh, lawyers, hormone therapy, doctors, that kind of thing. And getting people into those consultations, like people don't really want to go and see the hormonal therapy doctor. So you got to move them through. We do a, a nice quiz. So that gets the ball rolling with compliance psychology. And then we offer them um, the consult on the back end, but it's well thought out. Like this, the internet is awesome. And it's amazing that it scales, but you still have to be strategic. It doesn't, Things don't just like magically happen because they're online. Yeah, I agree. You have to have some kind of game plan at the end of the day or it's just going to be somewhat chaotic. Yeah, or it's just not going to work. You'll say, oh, I tried Facebook and it didn't work. Okay, but did you try it like correctly? You know, it's like anything kind of can work. Like you could probably theoretically make a billboard work. I mean, a bunch of lawyers do. Uh, but, you know, you got you to have strategy. You got to track it. You got to see. And like it's not like a channel wouldn't work or does work. Um, I actually started from my company recently doing LinkedIn um, ads. Um, and I had always thought those didn't work, but now they're starting to work a bit more. The cost per click is going down. Um, and the targeting is insane for B2B. Like you, have you ever done those? Yeah, I do a lot of um, uh, paid on LinkedIn and I think their, uh, their uh, segments in terms of uh, parameters you can focus on are, really thought out well and you have a lot of information to work with like you said in the b2b space oh it's awesome i've been doing um in mails which are like kind of like direct mail 
So that means that you, you do pay for them, but it's really cheap. It's like 15 cents a, deliver, um, a deliverable. And then you don't run into email deliverability issues, which is amazing. Um, and the click-through rate is insane on those if you have a nice offer. So I basically offer them an ebook to a consultation. That's basically it. I mean, it's, it is. And I didn't like it before because the cost per click was so high that it was like prohibitive to get a bunch of data. It was like 10 to 15 bucks a click or something like that. So it just wasn't worth it because I wasn't converting as much. But man, the in-mail, is a, that is a good backdoor strategy for sure. Yeah, I think it's one of the best B2B platforms you can um, you know, have your clients on from an organic and a paid standpoint. Yeah, definitely. It's tough the other way. Like if you do, say, Facebook for B2B, it's possible, but people necessarily aren't on there like, hmm, wonder what kind of business thing I'm going to do today. You know, they're kind of on there to screw around. Yeah, I agree. Just to kill time. Yeah, totally. So what's one piece of advice you have for the audience, personal or professional? I would say the best piece of advice is to pick someone who knows what they're doing and learn from them. And the, like, I don't, I don't sell coaching services, so I don't think this is me saying this. Like, sometimes you got to pay for it and you have to actually do it. Just buying the program doesn't work. I mean, I've spent probably hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point on, um, on education, but it keeps paying off because like in the end, in the digital world, all you kind of have is your education. You know, it's not like back in the day where you could be like, well, I have a farm and you don't have a farm so I can make more money than you. Now it's kind of like, listen, I know more than you and I can actually execute on it. But I see people all the time because I take these courses and they kind of go by uh, like segments, I guess. We're kind of in a segment with people and they don't do the work. And if you don't do the work, you're not going to get the results. Yeah, but I think it's like that with everything. And I think obviously the internet is ever changing. So you have to keep constantly learning or, you know, the, the strategies and tactics you implement are going to be outdated. It may not work or even for something like, let's say, search engine optimization may, you know, hinder your website performance organically as a whole as well. Yeah, I mean, like I, I mean, I've had some advantages and like I didn't grow up in like a terrible country or something, but like, I'm not any different than anyone else, except that I just keep pushing forward and never quit. Like, I've had all sorts of, you know, challenges and whatnot with this, and definitely not everything I do works, that is for sure. You should have heard my first uh, guest podcast, I was just like, eee, that was really bad. And my first couple sales calls were like George Costanza level terrible, where I would get off and I was like, whoa, that was bad for both of us. But then, you know, I took a couple courses on uh, sales calls. I took courses on how to be a better guest on podcasting. And you improve. And that's really the only difference between me and anyone else is I just don't quit. And at this point, you know, people, they say, well, you know, you've, you've been doing this for a while. And yeah, I have, but I wasn't always. Like when I started, I was just this doofus radio DJ. And the only reason I even got the radio DJ job is because I didn't quit. I had to apply maybe eight times. And they just didn't, they kept saying no until I walked in there with a paper resume. and was like, look, I need to talk to someone. Yeah, and I think you, you're basically outlasting everybody else. So, I mean, it's in terms of individuals and companies, the ones that succeed are the ones that outlast. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. Because you, you can make mistakes and people expect you to make mistakes, you know, unless you're like a doctor or something. And even then, you probably have a little leeway. But you got to like, that's, that's just the nature of it. You got to just keep pushing forward. It's probably like working out. Like, yeah, it's hard. I don't always want to be up at five in the morning, but I always am. And like some, some days I do, and I'm really amped about it, but there are days where I'm, I'm dragging just like anyone else. But that's, you know, that's why I work, so I work out of a co-working space. And that's why I see these companies come and go and come and go and come and go because they, they don't do the work. They go, it's out of a WeWork, so they have a beer on tap. So they go, they get drunk, they screw around. And then, you know, I, I see them working at Starbucks the next week, which is fine, but I'm sure that's not what they were going for. Yeah, I agree. So I really appreciate you stopping on uh, by today. Can you let the audience know how they can find you? Sure. You can go to uh, nerdsdoitbetter.com, which is my site. I got a little chat bot in there, which I'm uh, testing out, which you can feel free to chat if you want. You can also follow me on my very, very exciting Twitter feed at Adam Lundquist, which is L-U-N-D-Q-U-I-S-T. Um, that's really about it. You can link it with me or whatever, but I'm not promoting any books or anything. I just thought this was a cool podcast to be on. You know, I appreciate the stuff you do. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by today. Well, thanks for having me.